the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. So last week, uh, if you guys remember, we talked about... Who remembers what we talked about last week? No. Very good. The Feast of the Cross. Um, and that was Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Um, and we talked a lot about the, the two thieves. And we talked about how two thieves were in the same situation, faced with the same dilemma, faced with the same problem, faced with the same everything, the same weather, the same everything. And both of them just reacted very differently to the exact same situation, right? And because of that, one got paradise and one got, you know, honorable mention, <laughs> right? And, you know, we kind of read about them like, ah, too bad. And, and we talked about how in our lives, crosses happen and people react differently. Um, and unfortunately, many of us choose the path of the, the left-hand thief. Many of us choose the path of, uh, I'm not interested in the cross. I'm not interested in suffering. I'm not interested in sacrifice because it really hurts. I mean, it hurts to get like, you know, whipped and stuff, but it hurts a lot more when someone says stuff about you and then and treats you in a really bad way and you're supposed to forgive them. Right? And or they piss you off and someone says, you know, Malish, you know, just be nice to them and you're like, Do you know what they did? You know, I'm even talking to someone now whose whose parents he can't stand. He can't stand his parents. You know, and you're just like, Well, you know, you need to forgive your parents. He's like, No. You know, he's not nineteen and he's pissed at his mom because she won't let him go out. You know, he's in his deep twenties almost 30, and he's like, I'm not interested in a relationship with them. And it's like, there's the cross. There it is, right? And it's sacrificial. It's painful. You have your arms out. People are spitting on you and beating you, and that's what his parents are doing to him really badly. It's like hard for me not to get pissed off for him. And... And he's supposed to say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And he's like, no, I can't. I don't want to. And so I don't know what to tell him. I don't know what to tell him. I mean, he's right. <laughs> They're being whatever. Right? But I know the reaction he's supposed to have. I can tell him what it is. I don't know how to get him there. Right? And ultimately, he has to choose it. I can't make him, I can't guilt him, I can't, you know, say, you know, whatever. He has to choose it. So, the, the point is, the crosses come in our lives in all forms. Each of you has a very different one. And, and it's ultimately a choice. And it's um, a repetitive choice, unfortunately. You get over one cross, you think, I'm killing it, I'm past it. I can actually look at this person in the face now and not like get sick to my stomach. And then the next one comes. So the point of this story is um, when faced with a situation, people react differently. And so on Sunday, who remembers what the gospel was about on Sunday? The sinful woman. Huh? The sinful woman. That's right. The sinful woman. So... I'll read you the story. You all know the story, but in case you don't. One of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. He went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, so she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume as she stood behind him at his feet weeping. She began to wet his feet with her tears, and she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. And you know how the story ends, right? Everyone knows the story? So there's, there's lots of interesting things here, but I want to connect it to the cross. Is this the same story? Do we have Christ? And then there's two people, each one reacting to him differently? Same story, isn't it? You have the sinful woman. 
she sees Christ, she starts crying. You have Simon the Pharisee, he sees Christ, and what does he think? This man, if he was really a prophet, he would know what manner of woman that he's judging him. His own host, the guy who invited him over for dinner, is judging him and hates him and thinks he's a fraud. So you have the same Christ, each one's equidistant from Christ, and it's the same story. One gets what? Everything, and one gets nothing. Right? And you can imagine, right, that we sometimes fall into this boat, right? We'll have, you know, this is, the, Simon had Christ over, right? And, you know, maybe you could say, you know, Jesus sat in this chair. I would love to have the chair that Jesus sat in. But we do the same thing, right? We say, you know, uh, Amba Serapion came over and he sat in this chair right here. Or Amba Toedrus came and he sat in this chair right here. Really? This chair? Yeah, this chair. Wow. Let me touch the chair. Right? And yet, you can be right next to Amba Serapion or the, or the Pope or a saint or Jesus and get what? Nothing. Can we go further than that? Can you be next to Jesus and get nothing? Can you? Let me ask you something. This woman, she's been sinful for whatever, I don't know what her sin was, a whole long time. And when she saw Christ, she started crying and repenting. What's the difference? Five minutes earlier, she was the same person. She wasn't crying. She was fine. And she may have been okay with her life a little bit. It wasn't bugging her. And then she sees Christ, and then she starts crying. And, and can you imagine the scene? I mean, can you imagine the scene? If, if, if I'm sitting here, and some girl starts crying at my feet, and I'm like, just stop, stop. And then her, she, her, she lets her hair wipe my feet. And back then, feet weren't clean. That's why people washed feet when they walked in other people's houses, because your feet are disgusting. Can you imagine the scene? You'd be like, I'm embarrassed. Can you please get up? And she just starts sobbing. Why is she sobbing? What happened? Why wasn't she sobbing two minutes earlier? She came into contact with what? Goodness. Have any of you ever been in a situation where I don't know. You see something so beautiful that it makes you cry. Not, it could be art. It could be music. It could be watching someone interact with someone else. Have you ever witnessed somebody do something so nice and amazing and giving and gentle and thoughtful that it made you cry? Has anyone ever had that experience? No one? Hopefully you do. Right? If, you, if you haven't, go watch you know, some YouTube videos of people helping homeless people and, and watch the way homeless people react. That'll put some tears in your eyes. So what's, what are you reacting to? You're reacting to goodness. You're reacting to light. Right? Now, Simon was in the presence of the light. But like it says in the Gospel of John... Some people didn't like the light. Why not? Because their deeds were evil. So he was in the light. The light was shining on him. His reaction to the light was what? I don't like this guy. Is it possible that someone can come into someone's presence who's really, really good and really sweet and really nice and really all the things and say, I don't like this guy? Yeah, happens all the time. Just like read Pope Krillus' story, if you're interested. There's a guy, pretty good guy, does miracles, does stuff. And there's a, these, these people came into contact with him. What kind of people? Bishops, monks, priests, like the good people. And what was, it, what was their reaction to him? I don't like this guy. They came in, in contact with the light and they didn't like it. And so what you find here is this is the same situation as the cross. Two people, 
They come to Christ, one gets everything, and one gets nothing. Does this happen in our lives? Every Sunday. Every Sunday we come to church, and there's two people in line taking communion. One person gets everything, and the person behind him gets nothing. And the person behind him gets everything. Every Sunday. Can two people come to a Bible study and one person get everything and one person get nothing? It happens every Wednesday night. <laughs> right? I guess, did I ever tell you the story about... Uh, I did, I think, at the retreat. But I was giving a talk once at, in Seattle. to uh, we, we have these spiritual days for the adults. And so I was giving a talk and I look over and this woman... She's like almost my mom's age, maybe my mom's age. And she's looking at me and she's tears coming down her eyes. Right? She's so moved by what I'm saying that tears are streaming down her eyes. And I think to myself, wow, I'm amazing. All right? Look at, look at what I'm doing. I didn't think any of these things. But anyway, I saw her just like crying and I'm like, wow. And then as if God wanted to just make sure I was, you know, aware of the situation... I looked at the person next to her and he was like, just conked out. <laughs> and then I realized, here's two people. They're equidistant from me, hearing the same thing in the same way, the same voice, in the same temperature, in the same room. One's moved to tears and one's sound asleep, couldn't care less, thought the talk was boring. What's the difference? Is it me? It's them, right? It's their hearts. Right? And that's why every time someone comes up to me and says, that was a nice talk, I say, it's because you have a good heart. And I mean that. Because lots of other people are like, oh yeah, it was okay, it was boring, whatever, I was asleep. I look around, I see people sleep all the time. And I see people going, wow, what's the difference? Is it me? Can't be, right? You guys are right next to each other. So it's not me. Who is it? It's you. Right? And some people... Simon, woman, they come, one gets everything, and one gets, I can't wait till this guy's done so I can go to UTC. <laughs> Just kidding. All right, so, and of course this reminds us of the, not really, this reminds us of the, another, the parable that Christ told, right? He told another story about a publican, didn't he? And a Pharisee. It was a parable. And he said that the publican was standing there, the, uh, the Pharisee, I'm sorry, was standing there saying, wow, thank you, God, because I fast twice a week. I give one-tenth of my kamun and mint to the, to the, to the temple. I'm, I'm a stud. I say my prayers. I feel so good about myself. And every time you hear Pharisee, I want you to replace the word Pharisee with what? Your name. Don't ever think the Pharisees were the Pharisees. The Pharisees are you. <laughs> Most of us. In the, especially in the Orthodox Church. Right? So every time you take Pharisee, just cross it out. I would just go through your Bible and just cross out the word Pharisee and write your name above it. Because every time we look at them, we go, Oh, those Jews, they're so silly. They don't get who Jesus was. They're just doing things. They think that's what God wants. Hello, have you watched the way you fast? Have you looked at Lent? When you're checking ingredients, you're like, I got a Beyond Burger, tastes amazing, I win. Okay, congrats. All right. So we tell this story about the publican and the Pharisee, and the Pharisee thinks he's hot stuff. And the publican did what? Some Nabuna does to this day during the liturgy. He beat his chest and said what? God be merciful to me, a sinner. And it said he couldn't even look up. He couldn't even look up. Look at that story. Again, two people at the temple in front of God. One's like, I'm amazing. And one is, I have nothing. Now, this guy, this publican and this, the, sorry, the Pharisee in the parable and the Pharisee Simon, they have an attitude, don't they? There's a, there's a feel to them. And unfortunately, I hear this all the time in us, in everybody. And the feel is this. 
Why did Simon the Pharisee invite Jesus to his house? I mean, don't you wonder why he invited him in the first place? He's not a big fan, clearly. Why do you think he invited him? He wanted to check him out. Maybe trap him. Maybe just figure out who this guy is. Maybe he thought, you know, the Bible says Jesus was homeless, right? He said he had no place to lay his head. He wandered around with a bunch of guys. So he's a homeless guy. And so maybe he thought to himself, you know what, I'm going to help this homeless guy out. I'm going to give him a nice meal. You know, maybe I'll introduce him to some people. Do people do that? Can you like, can you like um, go to a party just to get introduced to people in Hollywood, in politics? Sure, right? In fact, people love to do that, right? They'll pay a lot of money for influence, right? I'll pay a lot of money for dinner and then I'll go and I'll meet you. I'll hook you up with some politicians and you'll meet some Congress people. Influence. I'll give you access to powerful people. Was Simon maybe wanting to give Jesus access to some powerful people? I'll invite the, the big guys of the town. I'll invite the Pharisees. I'll invite the leaders of the Jewish nation and I'll give you access. I'll let you talk to them. I don't know why Simon invited him. But the question is, why did Jesus go? Like, if, if you invite me, and I'm Jesus, and I know you don't like me, I know you're not going to get anything out of this interaction, I know you're just going to judge me and probably bring sin upon yourself, why do you go? Huh? He went for her. Because he knew she'd be there. He didn't go for Simon. He went for the woman. Which makes me think, Jesus just doesn't fit with the powerful people. He doesn't, it's not his place, it's not his vibe. It's, it's just weird for him. He sits there, he's homeless, maybe he smells. Maybe like John the Baptist, he, he's disheveled. And all the powerful people who are well-trimmed and well-groomed and well-bathed and live in a nice place, does he, does he even fit with them? Because I want to go back to Simon. What was Simon doing? He was offering to God. He was saying, look, I'm going to offer what I have to you. Not what you gave me, which would be great. What I have. I have power. I have influence, I have money, right? I have a good voice, I give great talks, I serve the poor, I fast 55 days and don't cheat. I give a lot. I can give you, God. Do people feel like when they fast, they're giving, it, they're giving God something? Do people feel like when they come to church, like, you know, maybe I need to come to church to support church. I need to help them out. People need to show up. People need to give money. Do people feel that way? Yeah, people do. People think things like, I need to come and support the church. You don't need to support the church. The church doesn't need you. The church doesn't need you guys. The church doesn't need anyone's money. The church needs nothing. You need the church. And so this woman, when she came, she wasn't giving Christ anything. What was she doing? She was taking. She was there to take. Because I'm sure she felt bad about herself. And I'm sure she was crushed emotionally. She was broken. I'm sure she's tried having a bunch of relationships. I don't know how they ended, probably badly. I'm sure she was hurt. I'm sure she was betrayed. I'm sure some guy said something to her that just scarred her. I'm sure. And so she came because she may have been looking to try to make her life better herself and it didn't work. Maybe she tried asking her parents and it didn't work. She asked her siblings and it didn't work. She asked her family. She asked maybe the clergy, the Pharisees. And all the, all the community that's supposed to support her and make her better they probably all failed her. 
She's probably tried everything to get out of this life she's in, to get out of the rut that she's in, okay? So she came to Christ like, I'm here to take. I'm here to take. I need, do you guys want to come up here? There's like this very large space that's open. It's just making me, Yani. Faddal, Faddal, Faddal. There you go. <laughs> now you're just blocking, right? You could come off to the side. I mean, you know, or give your chair to one of the ladies. Yani. All right, yeah, I didn't know you guys were on chairs. I forgot, my, I forgot what I was saying. Oh, no, it's okay. Oh, no. So she came, she came to take. Guys, how do we say our father? Like this. And what is this position? This is the position of a beggar. So when we talk to our father, we talk like a beggar. In fact, I, I remember uh, Abuna Krillis was talking about Pope Krillis once. And he was asking his father in confession about him. And he said, tell me about Pope Krillis. Do you know what he said? He said he was a beggar. He was a very good beggar. Look at the stance, guys. This is the stance of a real Christian. This woman didn't come to give of her whateverness. She came to take. Abuna Dud Lemay has this great expression. He says, imagine they tell you, you can go to a bank and you can take as much money as you want. Whatever you ask for, they'll give you. And he says, and someone walks up and goes, I need $5 because I just want to get a sandwich. And the teller says, are you sure? Because we have a lot more. How much do you want? He says, just, I just need a sandwich. I'm fine. And he says, and the person next to him has got two you know, empty suitcases and is loading up the suitcases. He says, this is the way God is with us. God gives what we ask for. And so when you're like this woman and you're a beggar, God gives, I'm going to use an Arabic word, sorry, bisakhet. What does that mean in English, anyone? Like, almost in a, what's the word I'm looking for? Almost foolishly. God, like, you know, like, like imagine you're holding up a cup of water and someone just takes a gallon and dumps it on the water, in the cup. That's, that's giving like that. Someone says, you know, hey, do you have five bucks? And here's, here's a hundred. This is the way God gives. Why doesn't he give to me like that? Because I don't beg. I have to come and beg. And when I beg, that's the way God gives. So sometimes when we come to church and we get nothing and we're like, I'm getting nothing. Did you come to take? Did you come begging? Did you come asking for grace and for forgiveness? That's the stance. And that's why when two people come to church and one takes communion, one gets everything and another person like Simon just kind of leaves the way they came. It's all about the stance and the posture before. See, Mark's yawning right now. <laughs> All right. Let's see if I have anything to say. So I want to read you a quote from St. Isaac the Syrian. I'm always going to call you out, Mark. Madish. He says, My sins are many, my Lord, but your compassion is greater than my sins. My wicked deeds increase in number, but they are incomparable to your mercy. Your love is greater than my sins. I look, my Lord, at my sins, and I am speechless at how willful I have been. Observing your deeds towards me, wonder seizes me. How I have been rewarded by you in a way opposite to what I have merited. This is perfect. My sins are many, but your compassion is greater. And so sometimes we come to God and we are broken because of all the crap we've done. 
and we think to ourselves, I'm beyond hope. I'm beyond repair. And unfortunately, un- really unfortunately, there's people like Simon who think, I'm doing pretty good. Don't ever get in that boat, guys. Don't ever be in the boat that says, I think I'm doing pretty well. The day you say that, know that you are lost. You don't, you don't, even, you don't even understand where you are. Our stance is always that of that woman. I'm a beggar and I need. And you have to always feel that way. My sins are many, but your compassion is greater. My wicked deeds increase in number, but they are incomparable to your mercy. Your love is greater than my sins. That's the stance, guys. The sins are many, but your love is greater than that. So in there is hope. Don't ever think to yourself, I've done too much. I've messed up too much. If my parents knew, if my friends knew, if Abuna knew, if whoever knew, save it. You're not that great. (laughs) You're not that, you know, you're not that amazing of a sinner. You haven't like, you know, killed it and broke the bank and, you know, done the things that no one... Nice try, right? That's actually kind of egotistical of you to think that you're a better sinner than other people. (laughs) I actually said that to one guy once. He was like telling me some stuff. He's my age. And I'm like, what, you think you're better than me? (laughs) You think you're worse than me? So the psalm that we read on Sunday is, the Lord gives strength to his people. That's how we come, guys. We come begging. And we come begging for strength. Mike Hanna, when he gave the talk a few weeks ago, he said it perfectly. He said, we provide the struggle and God gives the victory. The victory is not ours. The struggle is ours. The victory comes whenever the victory comes. The victory comes in God's time. And believe me, the victory is not easy. And it takes forever. And it's frustrating. Why? Why make it frustrating? Anyone have a thought? Why does the victory need to be hard? Take a long time. And you have to fail a lot. Hmm? You're going to be humble? Why do you need to be humble? Yeah, the worst thing that can happen to you is overcoming sin quickly, right? It's kind of like the person, I don't know, who, whatever, I won't use that example. Um, Overcoming something quickly makes you what? Not appreciate what you have. You know, it's kind of like the, the parent, I'll use another example, the parent with the perfect kids. I hate those people. Right? And then they talk to you about how perfect the freaking kids are. And your kid's a disaster. Right? And, and sometimes, like, and, you know, forgive me, moms are ruthless here. You know, you'll be, you'll be sitting there with your little kid. He's a disaster. And she's just holding her baby who's, like, sweet as pie. Not, she's like, oh, well, you know what I do. You know, and she just takes a little jab, right? He's like, oh, I bet you you forgot to blah, blah, blah. Well, maybe next time at church you should do that so that your kid isn't a mess like he is now. And mine, you'll be like, right? So this happens, moms. It's, you know, it's going to happen to all of you. You're going to be sitting in the cry room and someone's going to take the little shot. It's going to piss you off, right? Anyway, um, what am I talking about? So the reason, the reason she takes those shots it's because she didn't have a hard child, right? God gave her an easy one. And so now she thinks she's mother of the year, right? And she's going to let you know about it. Now the mom who has the devil child, right? And we all know those, including our own moms. The mom with the, with the devil child, when she sees a mom with a, having a hard time, what's, what's the reaction? Sympathy, compassion, I'm sorry, Habibti, I know what this is like, I went through it too, you know, what can I do to help, can I hold something for you, do you want me to warm something for you? See the reaction, see the difference? Empathy, right? It's kind of like if I go visit someone with cancer, 
What am I going to say? I don't know what cancer is like. There's nothing I can say to really comfort them, right? I don't know what to say. But if someone's had cancer and they go and they get over it and they go visit someone with cancer, it's a different conversation, right? Now it's like, I get you and you get me. And now that person, is, they're going to talk to each other about how they get over cancer much differently than I will. I'll say, Rabbin Ma'ak, and I'll tub tub, and I'll say, let's read a verse from the Bible, and I don't know what I'm going to say. And they're going to look at me and say, bro, you have no idea what I'm going through, do you? You don't get this at all, do you? And I'm like, no, I don't. I've never had cancer. Sin, cancer. So when I've fought with sin, and I've fought against it, and I've lost, and I've had my face just rubbed in it, like all of us have, it's a very different reaction when I encounter another sinner. And this is why, unfortunately, we see sometimes, especially in the right wing, in, in the Christians that we see, both at church, in politics, on the media, very judgmental. And when I see a Christian who's judgmental and not sympathetic towards another sinner, I'm sorry, what conclusion can I come to? You don't think you're a sinner either. If you're going to judge anyone, then you must not think you're a sinner. You laughed last time and now you're doing it again. It wasn't... It just... Things happen, they jump out and it scares her. It's okay. Um, so, if I see someone judging, which I see all the time, my only conclusion, you don't know you're a sinner. Because if you did, if you've had your face rubbed in it, you're not gonna. You're not gonna speak that way. You're not gonna even think that way. In fact, you're gonna see this disgusting meth addict, alcoholic, whatever addict, and you're gonna put your arms around them and you're gonna say, "Let's cry together. Let's get through this together." And you're not gonna say, "What are you doing in my church?" That will not be your response. Unfortunately, that's the response we see. That's the response that crushes the sinner. That's the response that Simon gave, right? Can you imagine what that woman had to go through knowing that that a-hole was staring at her? That that guy knew what she was like? Can you imagine the daggers he looked at her? You entered my house. Can you imagine if a prostitute enters Ambassadopian's house? The look from everyone in that room would be like, what are you doing here? You know, and she's wearing whatever she's wearing from Hollywood and Vine. You know, she's got orange lipstick on and whatever she's got on. And she's like, hi, you know. And Emma Sarafian's like, hello. <laughs> I would pay money to see that. <laughs> Could you imagine what everyone around Emma Sarafian would do? Um, are you in the wrong house? What are you doing here? The daggers she got. Can you imagine the walk to the Pharisee's house, the amount of attacks that Satan did on her head. Can you imagine how many times Satan said to her, you're going to humiliate yourself. They're going to laugh at you. They're going to scorn you. They're going to say stuff about you. They're going to make a crack about you. Can you imagine that walk to his house? How much Satan had warfare with her and how much she had to overcome walking to the house. Anyway, I'll read you this last bit. So, one of them, one of them, she gets the giggles and she can't stop. That's the problem. She has to walk away. Happened last time too. All right. So, why is this happening? Why is one person getting everything and one person getting nothing. You just can control yourself. So Christ gave the answer. What did he say? Does anyone remember how this story ends? But to whom little is forgiven, who can end it? The same loves little. That's the answer, guys. So when I see that my heart is cold towards God, and my heart is cold towards other people, 
kind of like I've been talking about with, you know, the meth addict and the prostitute and the whatever, what does that conclude? What is that conclusion? To whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. So some of you will say, I don't know why I'm so cold. I don't know why I don't really have a relationship with God. I don't really know why I don't like people. I don't really have much of anything. I'm just cold. And by the way, there's something about this generation. I don't know if it's the media or something. There's like a coldness, a zombiness, a numbness to, some, to a lot of us, right? I don't know if it's just a constant stimulation or what, but there's a numbness. And here's the answer. To whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. So I'll read you this quote from Father Matthew the Poor. He says, If we find that our love is little, know that we have been forgiven little and that our sin is still great. Some of us complain that our love is weak. It's weak because the sin is great and the proportion of it that has been forgiven is little. So imagine everyone has this much sin. We all have the same amount. No one's got any more than anyone else. Don't kid yourself. So the only question here is not do I have a lot of sin or little sin. You're all the same. We all have the same. How much of that has been forgiven? What proportion of this has been forgiven? And I don't know what this is for you and I don't know what it is for me, but it's all the same amount. Have you ever seen someone after they pour themselves out to a priest? It's like they become insane. They want to serve and run around and help everyone. They will do anything and help out anyone in any way. The person loves much. Why? Because he's been forgiven much. There is a deep mystical link between love and forgiveness. The Lord taught it to us with the parable of someone being given, forgiven 50 versus 500. This wasn't addressed to the Pharisee. It was addressed to me. So the question we have to ask ourselves today, do you love Christ very much? What's the thermometer? How do I know? <clears throat> Let's suppose, and I like this example, that after church, I, meet, I, I greet you after church, and I tell you, and this just think of me, I see you at church and I say, Michael, I miss you so much. And you say, I miss you too. And then you walk up and we start talking. And you guys have all experienced these kind of people. What do they do? Yeah, yeah, I miss you. Yeah, how are you doing? Oh, yeah, that's great. Yeah, what else is going on with you? Oh, yeah, yeah, that, oh, that's cool. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, I, 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 I'm doing school too. Yeah, that's awesome. Anyone had any of these conversations before? Right? The person who's not even looking at you, who's looking at everyone else, trying to see what's happening behind you, trying to make sure they're not missing out on some activity or some interaction that they want to be a part of. There's someone else they'd rather talk to. That's the problem, eh? There's someone else they'd rather talk to. That's why they're not looking at you. They're talking to you, but they're not looking at you. Anyone had this experience? Happens all the time. Why? Because they don't really love you that much. There's someone else they're more interested in. So sometimes you go to church and you stand there and you say, Lord, forgive us our sins. Lord, forgive us our trespasses. Lord, visit our iniquities. Visit the sick of your people. Heal them for the sake of your holy name. Our fathers and brothers have fallen asleep. Repose their souls. And where are you looking? Not at God. Not at Christ. Anywhere but. You're looking at deacons. You're looking at people. You're looking at the words you're not looking at him. That's the problem. So that's the thermometer. If I'm praying and I'm talking to one person, but I'm looking at others, there's a problem. That means I don't love you, right? Because you know it when someone loves you. You're talking to them and they can't take their eyes off you. And it's like they're so engaged and it's like you're the only person in the world. And that's the feeling. And by the way, whenever people meet saints, that's what they say. They say, when I talk to this person, it's like I'm the only person in the world. They focus on me and they listen to me. That is a characteristic of the spiritual person. I'll continue. So there is no forgiveness and then there's no love. You won't feel love towards God and his children. Is there a way to increase this love, the love towards God and others? 
I run to God. There is. I run to God. I confess my sins and then my sins will be forgiven and I will feel a very strong love towards God. If you see someone who doesn't have love towards others, know that they haven't cast their sin on God. There is no relationship between them. There is no other way, my friends, to strengthen the bond of love between God and man except through the forgiveness of sins. This is how we feel God working inside of us. And as soon as he feels that his, a man feels that his sins are forgiven, he can't believe it and love starts to be formed. I'm sure many of you have experienced this. You come out of confession and what's the feeling? You feel great. You feel this bond with God. You feel love, right? That's the mystical link. That's what Simon was missing in the story. You said you weren't going to sleep, you feel That's the mystical part of the story, right? The more we've forgiven, the more we love. This woman was forgiven much, and so she loved much. Anyway, I'll stop there. Philo's asleep. Malish Philo. It's, I'm not calling you out or anything. It's not like the whole point of this talk was that, but I mean... <laughs> oh, I know. And Philo loves the most, I think. And he also yeah. sleeps the most. <laughs> the worst part is he came up to me and said, Today, I'm not going to sleep. Did you? Hello. <laughs> Any uh, thoughts, questions? I feel like we don't have much discussion, so I feel bad. I, I kind of monopolize all the airtime. So, anything to add? Thoughts, feelings, anecdotes? I'll leave a long, awkward silence to force someone's hand. One person, then I'll stop. Yes. How was your day? <laughs> My day? It's busy. It was good. Did you guys sell late today? Huh? Did you guys sell late today? Or I did not. I went to liturgy. So I have a Urban. Don't, for, don't let me forget. A lot of Urban today. And I had a great meeting afterwards. It was very enjoyable. Did you have any uh, Zoom classes? I had nothing today. No Zoom. I teach Tuesdays and Thursdays. Unless I'm going to UCR, which I'm going tomorrow. After. Anything else? All right. Glory be to God forever. Amen. You guys can all go to UTC.